While I was working on the next audio project, I had to resolve some electromagnetic interference issues that negatively affected the functionality of the circuit I was building. While in the process of solving these problems, I realized that it could have been beneficial to make a video on the subject before moving on with any other topic that needed this kind of knowledge. And so, the idea of this video was born. I therefore put together all I know about EMI, EMC, EMP, EMS, and so forth. I even collected more data doing some research, and finally I created this tutorial that you are now about to see. Enjoy! Whenever a current flows through a wire, it creates a magnetic field surrounding it, and if the current is variable, so would be the magnetic field. Conversely, if we put a wire in a variable magnetic field, an electromotive force will be generated in the wire, in other words, a voltage. This voltage, in turn, produces a current in the wire when it forms a closed circuit, like a closed loop. Another way to describe this phenomenon is this. If we have a variable magnetic field in a volume of space, a variable electric field will be automatically generated in that same space. It is that electric field that generates the voltage on the wire and causes the current to flow through it. Again, these concepts present a duality. If I generate a variable current in a wire, a variable electric field will be present on the wire and its surroundings. As a result, a variable magnetic field will be generated in the same volume of space. In fact, whenever there is a variable electric field, there is also a corresponding variable magnetic field and vice versa. Each of the two variable fields cannot exist without the other. They always both exist at the same time. It is for this reason that we usually refer to them as a single field called electromagnetic field. And because the electromagnetic field changes over time, it also affects its surrounding space and the spaces surrounding that space and so forth. Basically, the effects of the electromagnetic field is visible over long distances and so we say that electromagnetic fields propagate in space. We call this an electromagnetic wave. Light, for example, is an electromagnetic wave and propagates in space at what we call the speed of light. A physicist named James C. Maxwell, back in 1861, put together all the knowledge of the time and elaborated a set of four equations that completely describe how electromagnetic fields work and how electromagnetic waves propagate. These equations are known today as the Maxwell's equations. The concept of electromagnetic waves is widely used in electronics to make devices that can receive and transmit information using this physical property. You know very well these devices, they are called radios, and they can be used on their own in, or inside a wide variety of more complex devices, like TV sets and cell phones. Without the electromagnetic waves, the global telecommunications system we enjoy today would not exist. However, there is a negative facet on the electromagnetic fields and waves. Electromagnetic waves are continuously transferred from one circuit to another, or from one part of the same circuit to another, as long as a variable current is produced. The problem is that, most often than not, we do not want this kind of interactions. Whenever an unwanted signal is generated in a circuit because of the electromagnetic fields that surround it, we call it noise and we try our best to remove it. The generation of these unwanted signals is generally called electromagnetic interference, or in short, EMI. The action we take to avoid and prevent EMI is called electromagnetic shielding, or EMS. Basically, it works by putting a shield in between the area where the source of the electromagnetic field is located and the circuit that is negatively affected. When talking about this subject, you may encounter a lot of acronyms that are used by engineers to convey the idea with less words. Here is a list of the most common acronyms. EMI, which you already mentioned, or electromagnetic interference. EMC, or electromagnetic compatibility, EMP, or electromagnetic pulse, EMS, or electromagnetic shielding, RFI, or radio frequency interference, RFS, or radio frequency shielding, and finally EMF, or electromagnetic field, which is an acronym also used for electromotive force, but the two concepts are totally different although connected. There are several sources of EMI, some of core in nature, others are created by us as a byproduct of the machines and devices that we use daily. 
Since the production of EMI is a bad thing, the governments of all over the world provide guidelines to help reduce the generation and the effects of EMI. They also define rules that specify the maximum amount of EMI that any device can generate. This helps manufacturers in creating compatible devices that do not influence each other. If we had to make a list of all possible sources of EMI, that list would be incredibly long. Here are just some examples. Some natural occurring EMI EMI are solar magnetic storms that occur from time to time on the surface of the Sun and may cause huge electromagnetic waves that can propagate toward Earth and cause a disruption of electric and electronic devices. Lightning, especially during thunderstorms. The Earth's magnetic field flux, which is caused by moving an electric device across the magnetic field generated by the Earth, thus creating unwanted electric fields and currents inside the device. And also, here are some human-created sources of EMI, TV sets, radios, cell phones, brush motors, fluorescent bulbs, computers, tablets, microwave ovens, power generators, car engines, arc welders, brownouts and blackouts in the power grid, electrical power lines causing the well-known humming that can be even heard when getting close to a high voltage power line, and also voltage sags and spikes in circuits. And the list goes on and on, and each item in this list is potentially a noise generator that can affect and even totally disrupt the functionality of an electronic circuit. That's why all electronics equipment that is sensitive to the MI needs to be protected with shields. We call this protection electromagnetic shielding or RF shielding. Whenever we have an electronic device that is sensitive to electrical noise, we need to provide it with some sort of electromagnetic shielding or EMS to make sure that the electrical noise generated by the EMI is reduced below a value or threshold that the device can safely handle. Sometimes very sophisticated and sensitive instruments have a really low threshold, a condition that is very difficult to achieve, but nonetheless is necessary. Example of electronic devices that need EMS are electric wires used to transport audio, video and radio frequency signals. To protect them we usually do things like surrounding them with a metallic shield. Such cables are called coaxial cables. RF equipment, radios, cell phones, TV sets and so forth need to be shielded for unwanted noise. In fact, EMI can make sounds difficult to understand or it can distort pictures and videos, for example. Audio equipment. Again, we don't want to hear noise when we are listening to our preferred song or band. Medical equipment like EKG machines and generally any diagnostic equipment that affect human life and we don't want that the wrong noise at the wrong time causes somebody to die. Avionics. What if the airplane instruments stop working during landing because some EMI was generated by the unshielded device of a passenger? That's why they don't want you to use any sort of electronic devices during takeoff and landing. Certain lab tools, like oscilloscopes, we want them to measure the signals of our circuits under test, not the noise produced by electromagnetic fields in the room where the instrument is located. And again, the list goes on and on. Whenever we create a new device, we always need to make sure first that it will not cause EMI that can affect other devices, and second, that it will not receive too much EMI from the surroundings. The ability of creating electromagnetic shielding depends on two different problems properties of the materials, the conductivity, which is the capability to allow the movement of electric charges, and the magnetic permeability, which is the capability of some substances to facilitate the flow of a magnetic field through it. In other words, the permeability works for the magnetism like the conductivity works for the electricity. The conductivity property allows to shield from electric fields, and the permeability property allows to shield from magnetic fields. Unfortunately, there are no materials that have simultaneously a good conduction and a good permeability, so we choose one material or another depending on what aspect we need to give priority. Shielding due to conductivity is achieved by the property of what is called the Faraday cage. Michael Faraday was a British scientist that invented the device in 1836. The cage was capable of shielding people from electric strikes and from electrostatic discharges. The device is today known with his name, the Faraday's cage, and its principle is extremely extensively used to provide electric shielding of all sorts. 
The device is basically a cage made of conductive material and is capable of shielding whatever is inside of it against electrostatic and electric fields. It works because an external electric field causes modifications in the distribution of the charges in the conductor that makes the cage. Once the charges are redistributed, they produce on their own another electric field that cancels out the original field and prevents it to enter inside the cage. The better is the conductor of which the case is made of the better the cage works. Note, however, that the cage is supposed to be continuous covering of conductive material, without any hole. Only that way it can prevent electric fields from going inside. In practice, we do need openings in the cage, otherwise it would not be possible to put anything inside of it. But as long as the openings have a size much smaller than the length of the electric waves that we want to shield, the Faraday cage will work as if it was a continuous covering. So, for lower frequencies we can have bigger openings, but for higher frequencies we need to make them smaller and smaller, up to the point that for very high frequencies we really need a continuous covering. Another aspect of the Faraday's cage is its bad efficiency at the higher frequencies due to what is called the skin effect. When a constant current flows inside a conductor, all the movable charges inside the conductor participate in creating the current. But when we have an alternate current, the center of the conductor is used less and less with the increase of the frequency. So at the highest frequencies, if we don't have a very good conductor, since the current will move only in a thin outer layer of the whole conductor skin, the resistivity will be so high that the electrons inside will not move fast enough to counterbalance the electric field, and so the shield will not be effective. That is why, at the highest frequencies, shields are usually made with an external layer of copper or even silver, which is the best known conductor. When we need to create a shield for a magnetic field, a good conductor doesn't do any good. For magnetic fields, we need to use materials with high permeability to magnetic fields which conversely are poor conductors. The big difference with magnetism is that we cannot separate north and south poles like we do with the positive and negative charges of the electricity. Therefore, the lines of a magnetic field always go from the north pole to the south and cannot be interrupted. What we can do is to merely deviate the field lines and force them to go through a high permeable material away from the device that we want to protect. That is a totally different approach from the electric fields, where we instead cut the field lines and prevent them to go inside the Faraday's cage. As we already said, there are two kinds of shielding, those that work better against electric fields and those that work better against magnetic fields. Different materials have been adopted over time to achieve these two goals. To shield from electric fields, we need to use good conductors. The best conductors, however, like silver and copper, are very expensive, and so whenever possible the tendency is to use slightly less conductive metals that are still very efficient at the particular frequencies where the shield is supposed to work. And so you can see shields that are made of aluminum, or steel, or nickel, and only when strictly necessary copper or even silver is is used. Shields for electric fields can then be shaped as solid box, or as a mesh, or as a metallic foil, depending on the mechanical and electrical needs of the particular device. To protect the plastic boxes, there are even certain conductive paints that can be used to coat the plastic and obtain a relatively good shielding. To shield from magnetic fields, we need to use a material that is permeable to magnetic fields. Iron and steel are the obvious examples, but there are some alloys that are particularly good for magnetic shielding, like the silicon iron and the mu metal. Just to give you an idea, the relative permeability of the air is defined as 1. Iron with 0.2% impurities has instead a relative permeability of 5000. Silicon iron has a permeability of 7000, and mu metal has a permeability of 100000. Depending on how thick we can make the shield and the amount of magnetic energy that we want to stop, we will need to choose one solution or the other. For electronic circuits, however, we deal most of the time with electromagnetic waves and not just with constant or quasi-constant fields. Since electromagnetic waves have both an electric and a magnetic component, and since one cannot exist without the other, it is enough to shield from one of the two components to block the whole wave. And that is why 
electronic devices are usually only shielded against the electric fields, which are the easiest shields that we can obtain. Doing so, we can stop or reduce the electric component of the waves and therefore the whole waves, since the magnetic component will go away as well, and that just because the electric component is not there anymore. Here are just a couple of examples of devices and their respective electromagnetic shielding. A power supply, it is assembled in a metallic case so that it will not disperse the electromagnetic noise that it generates internally. A radio frequency cable, it is a coaxial cable where the central wire is the one used to transport the signal and the surrounding thick mesh is connected to ground and acts as a shield to prevent both noise to reach the central wire and the RF moving inside the wire to leak in the surrounding environment. And here is an instrument that is capable of measuring electromagnetic fields in the environment. It actually measures the power density of both the electric and the magnetic fields around its sensor. When creating an EMS, or an electromagnetic shielding device, we need to be careful to make it in such a way that it will actually shield our electronic circuit, rather than actually collect even more noise. Unfortunately, it is very easy to obtain the opposite effect. For example, if the shielding of a device is not connected to ground, the current that flows in the shield will not be able to be discharged anywhere. As a result, all the energy will be reflected in the surrounding space, thus defeating the purpose of having having a shield, or even worse, causing some resonating effect that could create even more noise. Another cause of trouble is when the shielding is done in such a way that the internal currents move around in a loop. If that happened, the loop will actually cause a concentration of electromagnetic waves, thus causing more trouble than not having a shielding at all. The last issue I would like to mention is the one of the gaps in the shielding, which if too large compared to the wavelength of the noise, will not be able to prevent the noise itself to go through. We therefore need to be very careful when making holes in the shielding, for example to allow wires to go through, or to allow us to see the display of an instrument. If the opening is too large compared to the wavelength, the noise will go through and the shielding will be totally ineffective. EMS is always a hot topic in electronic devices, whether they are low or high frequencies. We need to spend a lot of thoughts when designing the case of a device, and in case of radio frequency, even the design of the PCB deserves a lot of attention to prevent unwanted coupling of the signals from one section of the PCB to another, which is basically noise that is generated and distributed internally to the circuit itself. It is also important to distinguish cases where the device is supposed to deal with very low signals versus those cases where the signal is higher. When dealing with low signals, we may end up with noise that has the same magnitude of the signal being treated, and so we have to put a particular attention to the suppression of the noise, which could otherwise overwhelm the wanted signal. When dealing with higher level signals, the surrounding noise could sometimes be considered negligible, and in such a case the EMS becomes less of an issue. It is important, therefore, to address each case individually. There is no common solution that can be adopted for everything. I hope you enjoyed this tutorial enough to give it a thumb up. Thumbs up are a way to improve the visibility of the video so others can find it more easily and can enjoy it too. Also, if you have not subscribed to the channel yet, please do so now to help making more and better videos. Talking about help, a small monetary contribution would help too. There are a couple of options you can choose from, Patreon and PayPal, both listed in the video description below and at the end of this video. See you on the next video, and as usual, Happy experiments!